So um, when you measure uh, cupping or French press or espresso, you need to filter the, um, the brew in order to guarantee that your reading and the refractometer is accurate. Uh, these types of uh, brewing methods leave a lot of uh, undissolved solids in the coffee. Those undissolved solids can settle on the glass of the refractometer and muck up the refractive index that it reads. So um, the best advice I have is go to the VST website, download the instructions. It's very quick, really, and just read it like 10 times. Because I wish I did that in the beginning, because I read it once. And you know, guys don't like to read instructions. So I, I read it. I was like, oh, yeah, I get it. I know what I'm doing. And then for a few weeks, I was making some stupid mistake because I didn't read the instructions carefully. And then I talked to Vince, and he's like, what the fuck are you doing? I read the instructions. I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry. So, um, but anyway, it's good to read the instructions and maybe to print it out and reread them once in a while, because a lot of us kind of skip steps. When it comes to filtering, um, they sell these little plastic syringe filters. The unfortunate thing is that uh, they're very expensive. They're very precise little filters. They filter down to 0.2 microns or some crazy thing like that, and it does a great job. Many people use other types of filtration to do the job, like doubling up AeroPress filters and that kind of thing. I've done it many times. Um, I have very mixed feelings about it because it, it gets you in the ballpark, but it's not that accurate. So it's one of those things, it's like, I don't know if it's worth doing something that kind of gives you sketchy data that you're not 100% confident in. So definitely if you do it, you'll see the range of readings with the AeroPress filter will, will be like this wide, whereas the, uh, Syringe filters will be like this. So. Uh, the ah. So, so what's, what's interesting is, let's say you make um, a V60 with a paper filter. OK. Uh, you might say, well, if, if that's good enough, I don't have to post filter. I don't have to filter it again to put under a refractometer. Then why can't I just make a French press and pour that through a V60 filter? Isn't that the same thing? But it's not. Because when you do an immersion brew, uh, you get these colloids that are very hard to kind of break apart. And um, when you pour them through the paper filter, basically the paper filter doesn't catch all that it should. But when you make a V60, for instance, the coffee bed itself is a form of filtration. And it catches a lot of the fines and colloids and things. So the, the paper filter doesn't have to do, uh, it, ha it has a very easy job, the paper filter. Whereas if you ask a plain paper filter to just catch all the crap in a, in a French press or something like that, it's not going to be able to succeed well enough. Is that an OK answer? Is that, am I answering your question? Well, Uh -huh. Oh, so you've made a Chemex with a paper filter. Or yeah. No, no, no. So I have two two answers to that. One is that you should never make Chemex, um, and the other. <laughs> sorry, where's where's Magda? Hey, Magda. <laughs> um, sorry. The other thing is that. So the coffee bed in the Chemex does a lot of filtration, yeah. and then the paper filter finishes the job good enough for the refractometer. Yeah. Okay. And just to be clear, and I'm, I hope I'm answering your question properly, but if you made a French press and you poured it through a Chemex with the paper filter there, that's not good no, enough. No, 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 no. Okay. No, yeah. So any uh, paper. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay. We good? Other questions? We have well, we have time for questions after you finish, or however you like. Okay. Okay. I just, uh, yeah. So I'm going to shi shift gears a bit to something unplanned. That's why I wanted questions on this before moving on to okay, something else. Okay. Sure. Yeah, it's, you know, but, uh, you're in charge. <laughs> uh, you have 15 minutes. Kelly, that's you, that's Kelly, all I care you, about. Do you have really. any questions, Kelly? Huh? Do you have any questions? Uh, I you think know, I will. I got to say, la last year, last year at Barista Camp, so James Hoffman was sort of doing Kelly's job, and I did a talk on roasting, and James just. I like, kept asking questions and they just got harder and harder and harder. And I was like, I was like trying to answer the questions. It was actually quite fun, but uh, kind of I'm, hoping you torture me with questions. I'm, I'm going to start soon, but okay, I'll, I'll okay. let you so, breathe um, a little bit more. So this morning I was watching people brew with the bun and we got to talking about batch brewing. And I realized that this is something I really, I really want to talk about because like you can go apply it tomorrow at your cafe where you work. It's useful. It's, it's very powerful. And it goes like this. Um, a lot of people do batch brew by sort of playing with parameters, playing with grind, playing with ratios, and it's, it's sort of like the old days with espresso where people are always like messing with all the variables. But you need a little bit of like a sound fundamental basis for why we're doing what we're doing and what the goals are when you make a filter brew, a batch brew. Okay. So unfortunately, all the different batch brew machines have different programming parameters to play with, so that gets a little bit tricky. I can't talk about all those. But what I can, what I can talk about is this. 
here are what I think your goals should be when you do a batch brew. Um, so you, you've chosen your ratio of grounds to water. Just, just stick with that. Don't mess with the ratio, OK? Be happy at 16 to 1 or 17 to 1 or whatever you're doing, OK? The total contact time, meaning from the time that water starts spraying onto the grounds to the time that the flow from the brew basket breaks and turns into a drip, that's total contact time, that should be ideally in my world, and you can obviously disagree, this is fine, but about six to six and a half minutes. You can get a brilliant brew at four and a half minutes, five minutes, five and a half minutes, but I will say that uh, you get more caramels, or you get sort of the optimal potential amount of caramels and sort of heavier, sweet, uh, riper things going on when, you, when your total contact time is about six to six and a half minutes. And a long contact time like this also technically allows you to use a little bit of a coarser grind, which is a good thing. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go back to the grind in a second. So you choose some kind of extraction range. Let's say, let's say you choose, like, uh, you like 21%. You choose your brew strength, 1.4. Use some ratio that can give you that. And you aim for this contact time of six to six and a half. And very importantly, and very few people accomplish this, but trust me, it really is like, what you should be looking for. The coffee bed at the end should be flat. If your coffee bed is climbing up the filter wall a bit, it means that you've created a relatively uneven extraction. The more stuff that goes up the walls, the less even your extraction is. So let's say the coffee bed is draining for the last two minutes of the brew cycle, and some grounds get left up on the wall. Let's say some of those grounds are out of the brew for the last two minutes. So the grounds at the bottom might be uh, extracting for, say, six minutes, and the grounds up on the wall only extracted for four minutes. That's not a good thing. It's, it's, it's kind of like, imagine you made a French press, and at four minutes out of a six-minute brew, you just arbitrarily decided to take 30% of the coffee out, the grounds out. Like, fine, your coffee might taste good in the end or such, but it was a strange way to make coffee, and you really don't want that to happen with your batch brew. So <clears throat> it's actually a little tricky to get this. You need, you need to sort of play with your grind and your ratio and everything else to make all these things happen at once. If your grinder burrs get dull, it gets harder and harder to keep grounds off the walls. If your brew time is too short, it means that the slurry gets very high during brewing because water is, is pouring faster into the, into the slurry, and it will be higher, and then it'll more likely uh, have ground settle on the wall. So there's a lot of moving parts you got to play with, but don't stop until you end up in a zone of six and, a, six and a half minutes total contact time and a flatbed and the extraction strength you want. Now, I'm going to tell you two things. One is that this will not work if your coffee bed is too shallow, OK? So let's say you go out and you buy a Fetco or a bun, and it's designed to do up to a gallon and a half. But you're a specialty coffee shop, and you want to serve really fresh coffee, so you decide you're only going to brew uh, two liters at a time into a nice little two-liter pitcher, and you're going to try to turn it over quickly. That's, that's very enviable, and that's great. But let's say your brew basket is designed to brew four to six liters. Your brew basket's going to be very wide, which means that your coffee bed will be very shallow. That shallow bed is going to be a problem, and it's going to get in the way of accomplishing all these things at once. So you need the appropriate bed depth, which is about three to five centimeters. And that's kind of overlooked. Like Even the best coffee shops I've ever been to in the world, like almost every time when they started batch brewing, I would walk into a shop and be like, ah, you, that's, that's a problem. And they were like, oh, that, that really fixed everything. Like it's, it's a huge thing, totally overlooked. The last thing I want to say about it is that um, one of the reasons a long total contact time is good is that if you can keep the grounds wet for a long time to get to a certain extraction level, you're going to use a coarser grind. Not many people have probably ever thought about it this way, but at a certain extraction level, not with espresso, but with everything else, the coarser the grind, the better your coffee will taste. So if you can get to 20% with an even brew with one grind setting and with another grind setting, the coarser one's going to taste better. And it's going to taste better because the proportion of the coffee bed that is made up of fines the little fine particles that always overextract, the coarser grind is going to have less fines, fewer fines. And so therefore, in the mix of 20% extraction, you have less bitterness and less astringency with a coarser grind. Any questions on that? Does everyone want to think about that for a while? No. Callie, what do you think? Is that new information? Is it interesting? I think that is interesting. Uh, I've known that before, but I, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. You know, uh, Marino Petraco, the, the lead researcher for Italy, I met him once for, for, uh, for a glass of wine in New York many, many years ago. And uh, I was so, so excited to meet this guy, right? <laughs> and and uh, so for one hour, I asked him questions. And for every single question, he's like, ah, oh, I'm not allowed to tell you that. 
right? Everything is proprietary. And I'm like, why did you meet me, you know? But, uh, but the one thing he said, he says, in his very thick accent, he's like, just anything that makes, uh, allows you to use a finer grind with espresso is good. And I was like, okay, I got my jewel. And he's, he's right. Like with espresso, going finer tends to be good. But with filter coffee, it's the opposite. Okay, so anything you can do to use a coarser grind with filter brewing. So for instance, if your bed is too shallow in a batch brewer, you're going to be forced to use a finer grind to slow down the brew through the bed. So that's not going to taste as good as if you shrunk the diameter of the bed so that you get a deeper bed and a coarser grind to get the same, all the, all the same numbers. Does that make sense? There should be somebody here who's scratching their head and says, I don't understand, because that's kind of messy. Yeah. Uh, is the water temperature also a way how to influence, in that case, uh, the cost of grind? Does it have more influence? Uh, would it uh, be a uh, way to influence uh, the uh, extraction, just making uh, yeah, I mean, a I, higher I, water temperature and using cost of grind to oh, extract Oh, I see what you mean. I, th I think the chemistry of like, how water temperature affects coffee flavor is something that you shouldn't mess with too much. Like if you, if you like the taste of, say, 93 degree water, like I wouldn't jack it up just to be able to use a coarser grind. Like it's not going to come out very good because when you go above like 93, 94, you tend to get acrid and bitter flavors that wouldn't exist at, say, 92 or 93 or whatever the number might be. And so I wouldn't really mess with that. But it's a good point, but I, I wouldn't be my favorite thing. Yeah, some extra agitation sometimes allows you to use a coarser grind. There's a lot of things you can do, but anything that allows you to use a coarser grind and get a uniform brew, if you hit your numbers, it'll taste better with the coarser grind, basically. So. Yes? Yeah, I mean, just because the machine says dripping, no, it doesn't mean, you know, but, right. So basically, from the time you push the button till the time it finishes brewing, and then however long it takes before the flow breaks and goes drip, 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 that's your total contact time. So it's, yeah, but it's not necessarily related to the number on the screen, obviously, yeah, yeah. Yes? Um, is um, a three to five centimeter bed depth something you recommend for immersion as well, or is it only for drip? Uh, totally irrelevant for immersion. Okay, and do you know how the, the bed depth affect the extraction in, in, in immersion? Uh, assuming that you've agitated it to some degree and gotten, you know, or at least poured the water in aggressively and gotten all the grounds to mix, it, it shouldn't really make a, a tangible difference. Okay. Um, how the bed depth will affect, I mean, the only thing there is like, how do you get the liquid out of the immersion brew? How do you separate the liquid from the grounds? Like then sometimes the shape or size of the bed is gonna matter, but that's for another talk, you know. The depth of 